Hello people, Zach here again today, and uh, as you can see, I am in the darkness right now, again. Um, but today it's not a rant, it's actually, I'm going to be talking a bit more about my uh, personal philosophy of the universe. So, it's, uh, this video I'm going to be talking um, about a couple of subjects. Uh, one is the idea of uh, nothingness and uh, versus what a thing is, and uh, the reification of space is a thing, um, vacuum energy, and um, also a bit more about subjective and objective reality. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So if you've watched a couple of my previous videos, you're most likely aware that I talk a lot about ontological and epistemological things, and there's a reason why I focus on this, and it's because the bedrock of science uh, is based upon certain implicit assumptions and uh, certain implicit postulates that people aren't even aware of, if uh, that makes any sense. But I also think that they're extremely important because th the less that we know about what these problems are, the more that they tend to propagate and create more errors further down the road. Um, particularly in our modes of thought and our way about of reasoning about the universe. Uh, I try very hard to create a view of the world uh, which is not just based upon what I want to be true. Um, if it does seem that way, um, I apologize, but it's, it's actually based more upon what can be proven and, um, and what can actually be known. So... The first thing is, how do you even know what a thing is? Um, and so you have to have a clear definition of what a thing is, and there is no good definition of that uh, in science. But the way that I define it in my own particular philosophy is I say a thing is that which can be separated from other things and bounded. And so uh, this very easily makes it possible to define what nothing is because nothing is um, contraction of not thing and not thing is uh, the opposite of thing which is it is that which bounds and separates things and uh, so now that you know what nothing is um, and you know what a thing is you can very quickly start to understand what things are are nothing and what things are things um, for example space space is a nothing and the reason why is because it bounds and separates things um, now some people might use the uh, the argument that you know you could separate space from space um, with things which is uh, I which is a good argument I think uh, from the outset uh, until you start thinking about the the largest thing you know, like, um, if you could imagine the largest thing in the universe, uh, the largest thing in the universe, um, would still have to be bounded and separated from other things. Uh, but if it's the largest thing in the universe, like if it's infinite size, you can't bound it for one and you can't separate it from other things for two, which means that it can't be a thing. Um, but nothingness, on the other hand, like if you know that nothingness has no properties and it has no attributes. So what this means is it also has no size and no geometry. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's infinitely small. Uh, there's a difference between um, having being uh, minuscule, like, or in just having no size at all. Um, and this is one of the reasons, this is also one of the topics as well where I get into the idea that nothingness and infinite are correlated to each other. Um, not just um, from philosophical and linguistic aspect, but also from a mathematical aspect. They share the exact same mathematical problems. Um, logically and like philosophically speaking, um, nothing is infinite. And there's multiple ways of interpreting that statement, which I could go into, but um, I just kind of redirect you to some of my old videos on that. But there's also um, 
different degrees of infinite and different degrees of nothingness, which is another thing I wanted to cover as well. Um, this is one of the reasons why we can operate mathematically on sets. It's not that we can actually uh, calculate what something is specifically, but we can calculate like the degrees um, to which they grow. But anyway, um, coming back to the topic, anything that's nothing is infinite, and anything that's infinite is nothing. That is a, a, a biconditional thing, and like you can observe it mathematically. But the thing is, like, there's different kinds of nothing and different types of uh, kinds of things. Like, uh, just because something is a thing in space does not necessarily mean that it's a thing in time, and just because something is a thing in time doesn't necessarily mean that it's a thing in space. Um, it's a perspective uh, issue. And, and what I mean when I say that as well is, like I said, nothing is that which bounds and separates things. Uh, so if you can imagine um, an object that never changes. Like if there is an object that never changes at all, um, outside of space, if you're just considering it within the nothingness of time, um, it's not bounded or separated from other things in time. Um, because it's entirely unchanging and there's, there's no differentiation. And, and there's also like an inverse aspect of this as well. Like if so, there's something that was to exist entirely in time, um, it would not be bounded and separated by space because it has no volume. It isn't, it's not a temp, it's not a spatial existence. It's a temporal existence. Um, and I actually have terms for these two things. Like I call existence in time, uh, a thing in time. I call that being and, uh, existence in space. I call that form. Um, and when you talk about matter, it's a combination of both being and form. Um, so the idea is like there's almost like a yin and yang relationship here because something can exist um, within one kind of nothing but uh, be infinite within another kind of nothing, um, which is just a really interesting um, philosophical issue. Uh, and now to kind of get into some of the heavier hitting topics on this. Um, there was a, a video I saw a while back on, um, it was made by PBS Studio, where they were talking about uh, the nature of nothingness. And there, there's some things I agree about with here, and there's other things that I have problems with. Um, so to kind of hit the bad news worse and get that out of the way, um, they reify space as a thing. And it is not a thing. And this is this is a problem I have with general relativity, in general. Um, space is a nothing because it, it bounds and separates things, and uh, nothing has no properties and no attributes. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it's infinite. And um, if it has no attributes and no properties, it means it has no size, and it has no geometry. Um, so you can't warp space. So I think where a lot of that comes in is like, where, where you're talking about um, general relativity, I don't think that they're actually talking about space. I think that they're talking about energy. And this should be kind of obvious too. Like if you've seen the mathematics that goes into general relativity, like the matrices they're using, um, they're based off of like energy densities or energy momentum fluxes and stuff. Um, has nothing to do with space. The The reason why um, they use that explanation is because there's certain assumptions that you have to make. Like, uh, general relativity makes the assumption that nothing moves faster than the speed of light. Uh, and when you make that assumption, what it means is that any time that, that your assumption is violated, the only way that you can reconcile that uh, is by mat is by assuming that the space or time itself is being manipulated, um, and and this and this isn't just like a 
a, a hypothetical argument. Like, the Hubble telescope has actually had us observe galaxies moving away from each other faster than the speed of light. And this is, like, one of the, the goofy areas about general relativity that I always get upset about is because, like, we can observe things moving away from each other faster than the speed of light. So there is, like... We are objectively seeing, having this axiom being disproven, but no one wants to acknowledge it. Instead, what they want to say is that like space is expanding in all directions, um, and that's why that happens. You know, and I, and there's other reasons why they would have this theory. Like, um, if you're trying to explain the cosmic background radiation and why like the average temperature of the universe is like so uniform, uh, this is a good way of explaining it. So I'm not saying that there's no basis at all. But the thing um, is, is that the explanation came after the observation, so it's technically speaking an unscientific theory. Um, but there's also the fact that these, the system of mathematics that they're using, they require to to explain the expansion of the universe. You have to assume that there is all of this dark energy, and to explain the uh, rotation of the galaxies being faster than anticipated you have to assume that there is all of this uh, so called dark matter um, and the quantities at which these things have to exist in order for, to make this theory work mathematically 95% um, of the universe has to be either dark matter or dark energy and I, I don't know how this doesn't raise red flags with people that something that we've never observed um, that we can't cre even create in labs um, that's never been the output of any experiment uh, that it somehow has to be 95% of the entire universe for our math to work and I don't, I don't know how people don't see that uh, it frustrates me, and especially with like if I comment on a video on something, just bringing it up. A lot of people like they get extremely defensive about the topic, and they come in and they're like, "Oh, you're just an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about." You know, like well, I don't have to be a genius to point out the obvious. Um, but anyway, just getting away from the the topic of general relativity and my problems with it. The, the other thing that I, I do think that I, I that they did well that I, something that I agree with is that they say that nothingness um, doesn't exist and this is an absolutely true statement and I actually used to talk about this in some of my old theories um, I'm not sure if I, I've talked about it in any of my videos on YouTube but um, if, if you can imagine like a charged particle like you have a charged particle here and you got a charged particle here. Um, they got like different charges. There's a force that they're both exerting on each other, and the strength of that force is uh, a function of the of the distance between them. Um, particularly, there's a, an inverse square law where, like, the further away they get from each other, there's a drop off. Um, but the thing is, is that they would have to be infinitely far away from each other for the force that they exert on each other to be entirely zero. Um, but the thing is that they can't be infinitely far away from each other. To be infinitely far away from each other, they would basically have to be in um, separate universes. So, um, what this means is that no matter where you go in the entire universe, the energy of every single particle in the entire universe is overlapping where you are at. Uh, and, you know, if you if I want to cop out and say that, you know, like according to E equals MC squared or whatever, that uh, energy equals mass, which is, take it was what it is. Uh, what this means is that there is nowhere in space that you can go where there is truly nothing. There, there's always something. And this is also um, connects into some other ideas as uh, problems as well with like the foundations of physics. Like um, if we didn't, make certain definitions and assumptions, we wouldn't be able to calculate anything. So I'm not saying that these things are wrong um, per se, and I'm not also saying that um, they're not valuable assumptions to make. Uh, but take, for example, Newton's assumption that like an object in motion, um, for a particular frame of reference, an object in motion stays in motion uh, 
unless acted upon by an external force. Which means like the the this mo- the definition of momentum, like it doesn't just accelerate in another direction or whatever. Well, in the real world, um, that's untrue. Uh, an object is constantly accelerating. It's it's constantly because because it, it, there's always experiencing external um, masses or external electromagnetic forces. There's actually nothing uh, in the entire universe that's standing still. And, and in fact, um, if you want to get pedantic about some of this, um, when objects get down to extremely low temperatures, like um, near absolute zero, like quantum mechanically, they they start acting extremely strange. Um, like their their quantum states are all over the place. Um, nothing in the universe wants to stand still. That's just that's just the way the things are. Um, and what this means as well is that there's no such thing as a um, an objectively inertial frame of reference. There's uh, an inertial frame of reference is a definition. It's not. A thing that actually exists, um, and what this means as well is that, like, it, we have problems trying to define things like rest mass or or whatever. But like, and I, I think that one of the the things as well I want to bring up here is uh, the more that you think about this kind of problem, like trying to understand frames of reference the more that you realize that Cartesian coordinate systems can't really capture um, the kind of things that you're going for. And everything starts becoming more and more subjective. And I've talked a bit about the idea of subjective versus objective reality in the past. And uh, uh, just to clarify that this isn't just a woo-woo magic um, nonsense. I mean, this isn't just like... I didn't just begin with the premise that like, this is the universe that I want to live in and this is how I want it to, how I want things to be. Um, it happens to be the case that it unfolded in, in such a way that I thought that was interesting and that kind of connected um, in a way that, in full circle, in a way that I thought was really beautiful and elegant. But the it actually stems from trying to... Um, create a set of axioms and postulates and also um, a set of laws where we where you can prove things um, subjectively speaking um, anything that you see anything that you see you are never seeing the objective thing you're only seeing the subjective thing and I, I guess a, a very simple and obvious way of kind of explaining this is that like what you see, like when you when you're when you're looking like with your eyes or whatever, you're seeing the light that's like reflecting off of objects or being emitted off of objects. But you got to think is that that light is propagating, so you're not seeing the object as it is. You're seeing the object as it was, um, and so you're you're constantly in the past, which means that your perception of the world is actually like completely different from how things actually are. Um, and this just gets more exaggerated the further you go out. Like, and if you're looking at a star, stars several billion light years away. This means like the way that you're you're seeing it right now, you are seeing it as it was billions of years ago. So that that's one way of really um, hitting home like the idea of like subjective versus objective reality. Um, but there's also this other way. Like, if you're familiar with the uh, crypto craze that's going on right now, um, the way that crypto works. Uh, people have, well, there's two different types of wallets. There's something that's called a full node wallet, and a full node wallet has a private key, a public key, and it's something that's uh, it's a copy of the entire bit, uh, blockchain. Um, and the blockchain right now is up to like hundreds of gigabytes in size, so a lot of people just don't have it. Instead, what they tend to do is they have uh, light wallets, which just have the, the private key and the public key. Uh, but anytime they have to do a transaction, they have to uh, send those transactions off to a full node wallet. And the reason why they have to do this is because the full node wallets are the ones that validate the transactions. And um, the reward for doing that is uh, is mining fees um, and uh, some some part of the, the transaction itself. And that's basically how Bitcoin works. Um, but there, there's a funny uh, principle here, which is that like, 
if you had a copy of the entire Bitcoin on your hard drive, which a lot of people do, like you can have them offline disconnected. They call that a cold wallet. If it's connected to the internet, it's called a hot wallet. But if you had a, a cold wallet that's like sitting on your hard drive, um, over time, like it's just going to diverge more and more and more from the mainstream thing. But also on your machine, like if you had a private network where you copied it and like you ran all those machines together, you could just like give yourself all the money <laughs> or uh, even on your private machine like if you didn't want to create a whole network you just wanted to have your own machine like you could just take everyone else's money and give it to yourself um, but it would be entirely useless uh, because to actually use that money you have to agree with other people and the second it enters the the, the larger objective network like people can uh, look at your blockchain and say like no your, your blockchain's crap buddy here you have to update all of this um, just rejecting it. In order to do uh, that kind of thing, uh, you have to have at least 51% of the network, and you also have to validate faster than uh, the next guy. So it's a, a difficult type of problem to do. Not entirely impossible, but definitely difficult. Um, but the reason why I bring this up is because I, th I believe that reality works in much the same way. Um, Every particle in existence, um, and I, I don't say this in the strictest sense of the term particle, just a general term here, um, has a perspective of the universe around it. Um, the way that it sees things as they are, the way that it expects things to go to some extent, there's like a, a window per se of where it's looking at. Where like it's seeing somewhat into the past and somewhat into the future, and it's somewhere in between here. Um, it has its own internal clock, and so it. When I say that being uh, acts with reason, I'm not meaning like acts with thought. What I'm actually saying is that they have a bit of foresight um, behind how they view other things in the environment, um, which is very small. But anyway, um, to act with reason is to say, like, why well, I know that um, such and such is going to happen, so if I act in this way, I can get a different outcome. Or if I uh, act in this way, I can get a better outcome. But uh, anyway, this uh, idea of subjective and objective reality... Um, the way that Bitcoin solves it is consensus, which is sort of similar to the way that I think that the universe kind of works. It kind of averages things out or looks at the consensus, like what does everyone agree on happening? Uh, but there's also the authoritative uh, approach is to say like there's some group or organization or person who has the authority to validate or authorize um, these transactions. Um, and the consensus problem appears in many different places like you, you can see it in multiplayer video games as well um, like if I had a cheat engine running on a game for my computer I could just give myself items or ammunition or whatever inside of the game for my particular client um, and, and everyone else's copy of the game that never happened um, so objectively it never happened but subjectively it did and uh, this is a very difficult problem to solve as, as well this is uh, they, they have to create very complicated uh, libraries that try to solve this problem uh, sometimes they're a bit oversensitive and they react when they shouldn't um but the way that this, this idea works is also very similar to multiverse theory. Um, and the, the thing that's most hard as well about trying to wrap your mind about, about this is because like you're, you have to understand that there's two different types of, of things. The objective thing... Um, there, there is only one objective thing, but the thing is that it doesn't have a definitive state, like it doesn't have an actual position or an actual rotation or whatever, because what it actually is, is it's like the sum or the superimposed overlap of all of these different subjective things. 
So, but the second you look at it, it ceases to be probabilistic. The second you see it and it becomes subjective, it is what it is. It now has an actual position and now has an actual location. So the act of observing it is actually what collapses that probability function. Um, and, it, and it's kind of similar with like the way that these systems work, like video games and uh, Bitcoin is as well. Like you you can only see things as they were and you can only know things as they are now um, when you actually observe them um, you could probably predict to some probability based off of what you already know how things are going to go into the future um, but all that is is a probability function the future is entirely potential it's not actual um, the second you observe it it becomes actual and um, so it's a lot less magical than you might think it's, it's very straightforward um, putting putting math to this theory um, is probably going to be kind of fun and interesting I think um, and actually I don't think that the math would differ much from what is already there the, the main thing that's, that's different here is that I've given a concrete explanation to what's happening um, whereas quantum mechanics in general tends to kind of stray away from any particular specific interpretation um, but anyway that's just uh, I feel like that covers um, pretty much everything that I was going to talk about today I've, I've talked about you know what a thing is, what nothing is, um, the the idea of vacuum energy, the, or this idea that um, there's nowhere you can go in the entire universe where there's not energy there. Um, so in that sense, that if energy is a thing, um, somehow um, to some extent, like being equivalent to matter, that there's nowhere in the universe where there is no thing. Um, also on that topic, the idea that a, a the energy of a particle is part of that particle. Um, when you think about it, it's, it's like the being of that particle. And so in that sense, um, the particle exists everywhere. And if it exists everywhere, that means that there's nowhere in space you can go where everything in the universe isn't there. Um, but anyway, um, so we've talked about vacuum energy, we've talked about space, and why it's kind of ridiculous to reify it as a thing, because um, it's not a thing by definition. Um, we've talked about the different types of nothings, um, the relationship between infinite and nothing, um, also about subjective versus objective reality, uh, and how that ties in with quantum mechanics, uh, particular examples in, in the real world of how that works. Um, the, the problems with general relativity, like, um, the fact that it requires 95% of the universe to be black magic, um, by which I mean dark energy or dark matter, uh, which means that the math doesn't actually work out right. Uh, I think a better theory for capturing that might be something closer to MOND, um, which is modified Newtonian dynamics. There's, there's probably a couple of other competing theories as well, um, but I'm more fond of that particular thing. I think that fits better in line with uh, the type of view that I have of the universe um, I think that's uh, the only thing I might want to cover more in this video before I cut this off um, is the idea of, uh, of a particle in quantum mechanics um, and also what an atom is not because it's uh, particularly relevant to the video bit um, just because I think it's helpful to understanding the universe uh, a, a particle in quantum mechanics like when you think of a particle most people think of like a marble or they think of like a small mass uh, but in quantum mechanics a particle is basically just a field perturbation or a field vibration um, it has like a localized uh, area to some extent um, but the thing is that for something to be matter like when you're when you're thinking of a marble or a pellet or something um, matter has to have both 
volume and mass and not all particles have mass or and not all particles have volume um, so what this means is that not all particles are matter um, some are some aren't but when you understand that a, a particle is not always matter um, and, and you start asking, well, then what if it doesn't have like a defined volume, or um, how how would it have a spin? Well, the thing is that a spin um, is actually just a mathematical um, reference. Like it's they're referring to some geometric thing, which I guess is kind of nerdy and cool, but at the same point in time, it's an inaccurate term. Um, the spin is actually just referring to like the degrees of freedom that the, the perturbation happens. So, um, yeah, like a particle isn't what you would think it is. But another thing as well is like an atom. Um, all atoms in the entire periodic table are just like compounds of hydrogen. Um, hydrogen itself is a... Uh, has one proton and one electron by definition. Um, that's not something that they quantify. That's, that's by definition. That's, that's what it has. Um, there's an isotope of hydrogen uh, called protium, which has no neutrons. Um, and uh, ionized protium, which means like you, you stripped away the one electron that it had, um, that is the definition of a proton. So anytime like you're you're looking in chemistry and they're talking about like um, the the protons of an atom, what they're what they're actually talking about is like there's a compound of like all these different hydrogen atoms. Like when and that this is the thing as well. Like when you're um, they're talking about like building um, like nuclear fusion and stuff. Like nuclear fusion is basically just like if you fuse two hydrogen atoms together, you get a helium atom. If you fuse three hyd uh, hydrogen atoms together, you get a lithium atom. Um, and it doesn't always work out like that. Like, you got unstable isotopes because sometimes the neutrons don't work out. But here's the thing as well. A neutron uh, can actually decay into a proton, and a proton can decay into a neutron. Like, one can convert into the other, and vice versa. Um, so philosophically speaking, they're technically the same thing. It's just two different states of the same thing. And um, so what this means is that fundamentally speaking, there's only um, one type of particle in the universe. But um, also, when you're talking about like alpha and uh, beta and gamma radiation, alpha beta uh, alpha radiation is usually just helium atoms or hydrogen atoms, one or the other. Um, things that get split off from atoms, because that's the thing is like if you're splitting atoms, you're going to knock off some of the parts that were inside the compound. Um, and beta particles are basically just like electrons and uh, that are coming off of it. And then gamma radiation is just light particles. Um, I, you, I already covered what a particle is. So you can understand that that's kind of like a strange thing to talk about as well. Like um, alpha radiation, beta radiation, gamma radiation. Those are alpha rays, beta rays, gamma, uh, gamma rays. Um, they're all the same thing. Um Alpha particles are at helium particles or hydrogen particles. Beta particles are basically just like electrons or what they call um, oh uh, this particular like type of antiparticle. I think it's like a I don't think it's an is it an anti -elect positron. That's what I'm thinking of. Positron. Um, gamma rays are just light rays. Um, and another thing as well, like antiparticles. And I noticed this uh, in the past. Um, your antiparticles, like your positron, which is like your anti-electron, and your um, your anti-proton and your anti-neutrino, they they're basically just heavier or lighter versions of existing particles. Like an anti-electron is basically just like a really uh, light proton, and a uh, an anti-proton is basically just like a really heavy electron, and an uh, anti uh, I think it was a. I can't remember if it was a neutron or neutrino. Um, it's like a heavier, lighter version of the previous thing. Um, 
and you can actually look this up like on, on Wikipedia. They either they don't explicitly state this, but if you just look at the masses of these things and like their charges, like you realize that it works out almost exactly the same in both cases. Um, you also have like your um, quarks and uh, other particles like that. But the thing is, well, once you get into that territory, a lot of the people who are in the field like to pretend like that's very well established and very well supported when it's actually not. Um, a lot of these particles that they're saying exist and are proven to exist actually can't even make it to the detector. Um, and the way that they, they work as well is like they, they run hundreds and hundreds of simulations or hundreds of hundreds of iterations of the experiment and they have these supercomputers that'll crawl across the data and so they try to create models that fit the data and then they say that the data supports the model that they create and this is one of the huge problems like I think uh, Sabine Hasenfelder talked about this one time um, this issue that like sometimes we'll have like high sigma values that say that something is very likely to exist but it comes to find out it was just a pattern in randomness that came up out of nowhere so like a few years later the one thing that we discover just disappears um, and this tends not to be the case yet with quarks but like I just I have a hard time believing something that I can't experiment with my smell for one and for two it's just I don't think that there's enough evidence there to say that they actually um, they actually exist because they're not actually observed um, and I think it's also kind of silly because fractional charges have never been observed um, if you go through the history of electricity um, a charge I mean uh, an electron was actually originally defined as the unit of uh, discharge that happens through uh, an electrolyte um, when like one unit of charge breaks an atomic bond or something like that or I can't remember the exact definition off the top of my head but it comes from um, oh, uh, George Johnston Stoney and his uh, paper on the physical units of nature and uh, so for there to be a quark you would basically like you would have to split an electron, but an electron, technically speaking, isn't really a thing. Um, and I, I'd, I'd kind of refer you a bit to one of my videos on that, um, on the non-existence of the electron. There's a bit more information there. I might redo that video later, um, simply because of the fact that I don't think it was well spoken out. Um, but I did do my a lot of my research on that. So, anyways, uh, I think that's all for now. This video is getting really long. Uh, thank you for watching.